Please be seated. We are back on the record. Your Honor, I don't believe the state has any other sentencing participants who wish to address the court. Um, I'll just make a final uh, check. Is there anybody else who wishes to address the court? And nobody has signified that they wish to uh, address the court. Um, I just have a very few brief remarks and will make the state sentencing recommendation. I will rely substantially on um, my sentencing memorandum uh, as well as Ms. Paul's sentencing memorandum in this case. Um, there's really very little that the state can say. Um, you've heard from um, what we have um, characterized as the conscience of the community. Um, everyone that you've heard from today by way of victim impact statements, um, by way of presentations, um, are really our conscience. And they uh, speak through their words um, much better than Ms. Paul or I could. Um, it is startling to me that all of this tragedy, the reason that we are here today, um, it was 35 seconds. In 35 seconds, um, everybody's everybody in this room's life has changed forever. Whether it be the detectives who investigated the case, the the family members of the deceased, the victims, the loved ones, um, the ripple effect of the defendant's conduct um, will um, carry on. Um, certainly, uh, for as long as anybody in this room is alive, it's. Uh, unnecessary for us to talk about how shocking and depraved and senseless the defendant's conduct was because um, that would really just be stating the obvious and so there's no need to, to really talk more about that. We've been broken um, in many ways. This community has been broken by the defendant's conduct but sometimes you can be made stronger in those broken places. And it's for us who will carry on while the defendant serves the, the rest of his life in prison. Um, it is for us to be strong, as we've heard many times over the course of these last months. It is for us to be strong, but perhaps we can be stronger by what happened but maybe not for everybody. Uh, with regard to the recommendation, that it is a legal certainty that the court will sentence Mr. Adenoff to life in prison without the possibility of parole with regard to counts one through three. Um, we're asking the court to impose 240 months on counts four and five, um, all to run consecutive um, Firearm enhancements on each count to run consecutive. Uh, 
I'm not going to go into detail with regard to mandatory monetary payments that's set forth in, the sentencing, in our sentencing memorandum. Um, we are proposing, and the council has no objection, to a number of no contact orders uh, being entered, um, both for, uh, Mr. Kramer, uh, for Mr. Kramer, Mr. Levine, um, Mr. Brockhold, um, but also um, family members of those deceased, as well as um, other young people who were at the residence uh, on July 30th. Um, and there's no objection from the council with regard to uh, those no contact orders. Um, one, uh, I just wanted to make a record. Um, there was a victim impact statement. I believe that the court had not been provided, but I did provide to you were honoring chambers, and I just want to make sure that we close the loop. Um, and I believe, um, does your honor have that victim impact statement? I received an impact statement from Ms. Snitzler. Okay. And you've had an opportunity to review that? I have. But I, I believe that accounts for all the victim impact statements that were, um, that were uh, provided. Thank you, Mr. Cornell. Who would like to speak on behalf of Mr. Ivanov? Your Honor, I'm Walter Peel for the record. This is a tragedy of such depth and breadth that there is no way of expressing the loss that's felt not only by the victims in this case, but also the family of Mr. Ivanov. The defense team has had the responsibility of preparing and learning as much information as possible and addressing the question of what penalty should be imposed, which we have done, we feel, successfully. We are gratified by the decision made by Mark Rowe and his staff in electing not to seek the death penalty in this case. That leaves, of course, no option for this court in what sentences to be imposed. Mr. Ivanov will address the court as he has the right to do. No one else will speak on his behalf. But the court should not take from that that there is no one who is without interest, without concern, and who has not been affected by this tragedy. This is a human institution that we are in the courtroom, the body of laws that we are dealing with, and it is people who are affected in all respects by what happened. I've had the opportunity to spend many hours during the early morning, midday, and late at night talking with various members of the family. And I can say to your honor that there is a deep sense of loss a deep sadness and a deep regret felt by all members of the family and a great sympathy for the victims of this tragic act. Were circumstances different, that expression could have been made before today, but for various reasons, by agreement with the prosecutor, the defense did not reach out to the families and did not encourage Mr. Ivanov's family to express their feelings to others. But the court should know that this is a tragedy that is felt by everyone. I agree with what Mr. Prosecutor said. Adam speaks from his heart and he says what is true. All of us are very much affected by this. As we sat and listened to the the, the terrible description of the response to this event. Those of us with children could substitute our own children for those who were described as the victims in this case. All of us who have had the experience of loss could feel sympathy and understanding for the tragedy. We could not know what it's like for anyone, but we could understand that they hurt and that they have a loss. I've spent many, many hours with Mr. Ivanov. I've sat in the jail with him. I've discussed his case with him. I've discussed his feelings with him. I can tell the court that he has great difficulty expressing in public what he can express to me in private. 
a sense of loss and regret and a lack of personal understanding of why he did such a terrible thing. But it would be wrong for anyone in this courtroom to think that Alan did not suffer remorse, experience sadness, and understand the, the depth and terrible consequences that he caused and how his life will forever be changed. <coughs> his mother and father particularly are now experiencing a similar kind of loss, not nearly as severe as the, the three who have died, but nonetheless they share in the loss that's caused by Alan. We're thankful that Alan remains alive. And I think that's the only thing I can say is positive from the result that's taken place. Alan would like to address the court. We have no legal objection to the sentence that is to be imposed, but we would like the court to accept allocution from uh, Mr. Adenon. Of course. Mr. Adenon, you have a right to allocution in this courtroom. What would you like to say at this point in the proceedings before I sentence you? You have prepared a speech, and I'll read along. Um, the most precious thing any of us have is life. One's own life and the lives of those dear to us. Life is more sacred than anything. We are only given one life, our one opportunity to live, love, grow, exist. On July 30th, hopeless, suicidal, and outraged for jealousy, I violated the most fundamental trust of our community by taking the lives of three and harming the fourth. In the process, not only did I deprive three individuals of all the promise, joy, and experience of a lifetime, but I also caused untold anguish, suffering, and pain to an entire community. I cannot imagine the agony of a parent losing a child, but I'm devastated by the enormity and finality of my misdeed. I have ruined my life. I have caused my family a lifetime of sadness and loss. I have ended all my friendships. So even though I cannot put myself in any of your places, I do have an idea of how completely awful my actions were and the damage I have caused, the damage which cannot be undone. I want to apologize wholeheartedly to all those whose lives I've taken, Anna, Jordan, and Jake, and all of you whose lives have been so darkened by my actions, parents, relatives, and friends, as well as Will and his loved ones. I understand that this has been a nightmare for all of you. It certainly has been for me. And I don't know when, if ever, the darkness of my crimes will live. I wish to share that not a single day has gone by for me without reflection and remorse. I have cried my eyes out day after day. While I've been portrayed as a cruel, heartless monster and this murder has been judged as premeditated, I want everyone to know that I did not intend for events to unfold as they did that night. In a moment of shock, I pulled the trigger because I couldn't control my emotions, not because I was born a cold-blooded killer. I don't know what I thought would happen. I waited outside that house for hours, my heart racing like it would explode. And when I was discovered, it all happened so fast. Satan was in control. I have replayed the events over and over. How could I have done this? I cannot say, but I know that it was not my intention to take anyone's life. I never, ever was a violent or vindictive person, and until that night, I was more straight and narrow than anyone I know. Dear Anna's family, Perhaps anything I say will come off as self-serving and offensive, but please hear me out. Anna visits me in my dreams and talks to me all the time. I cannot explain how much I loved her and how much I still and forever will. I'll never be speaking to the public again. I forfeited that right. However, I'd like everyone to hear loud and clear that it was the ease of acquiring a gun that enabled me to act on my emotions. I don't mean to absolve myself of guilt or dodge responsibility, but I know for a fact that even in the feverish state that I was in, I never could have done this with my hands. I wish they never sold me a firearm, and I wish I was never legally allowed to buy one. 
I hope there will be continuous effort to change the gun law so that others cannot make such a tragic mistake. I would give anything to undo what I have done. If I could give my own life to bring the lives of Anna, Jordan, and Jake back, I would do so in a heartbeat. There is no justification for what I did. I take full responsibility, and I will spend the remainder of my life striving, however I can, to make amends for this horrible deed. Again, I am so, so sorry for causing all of you to be here today, for causing so much senseless pain. I will forever pray for the victims, their families, friends, our community, my family, and everyone who has suffered from this tragedy. May God be with all of you. Be sorry. Mr. Ivanov, when you entered your guilty plea and completed your statement of defendant on plea of guilty, you stood before me and acknowledged as I read your statement that you intentionally and with premeditation killed Anna Bowie, Jacob Long, and Jordan Ebner. Today you stand before this court and say you didn't intend this. Explain yourself. You may. Your Honor, I think my client is conflicted in the sense that there's ample evidence of premeditation and he was conflicted that night and it was described to the law enforcement that night about how he sat in that car and how he deliberated and acted with regret in terms of what he said today, I don't think is in conflict with what he represented to the court at the time of the plea. And it is rather the function of uh, a conflicted 20 year old who uh, struggles every day with his actions and what he did. And as uh, Mr. Cornell talked about, what could happen in 35 seconds? and his wish that he never went down that road and never went into that party and never intended to cause the pain and suffering that he did even though he knows full well what he did and that legally he acted with premeditation but today what is on display is the words of a very conflicted and remorseful 20 year old who is not shying away from responsibility for what he did in his very own words, acknowledges what he did, the pain that he caused, and would do anything to, to take back what he did. Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Ivanov, do you stand by your statement of defendant on plea of guilty? Yes, yes You stand by your statement that with premeditation you killed Anna Bowie, Jacob Long, and Jordan Ebner? Yes, and that you discharged your firearm with premeditation in an attempt to murder Will Kramer, Tristan Bratbold, and Alex Levine? Yes. Yes. Mr. Ivanov, the case, the charging document, the affidavit of probable cause, they don't begin to capture the horror, the nuance, the impact of your actions, of your premeditated crimes. Today, in this place, some of that has been shared. 
I heard about Anna Bowie. A young woman, full of life, full of promise, a world changer. I heard about Jordan Ebner, a light to all. Always positive. I learned about Jacob Long, a, a gifted young man, forward looking, known for his intellect and his athleticism. He loved unconditionally by their families, their friends, and the others whom they touched. I learned about Will, Kramer, Tristan, Bratfold, Alex, Levine, also loved, also admired for their promise, for the goodness in their hearts, in their hearts. I also heard about the impact of your actions. Dacian, the shattering, the waves of deep despair, the incomprehensible emotions, and the horrifying facts. the irreparable harm suffered, and the indescribable pain, the ripping away of so much, and a world turned upside down. I have heard about numbing. I have heard anger. I have heard despair. I have had a continuous nightmare described. I have heard parents grieve the incomprehensible loss of a child. Siblings describe the equally incomprehensible loss of a sister, of a brother, I have heard others describe the loss of their family members, their friends, <coughs> their loved ones. So I hope you can see that when you emptied that clip on July 30th of 2016, when you struck Anna and Jacob and Jake, you took away their future and their promise. And when you shot Will, and you shot at the others, all gathered for an evening in Mukilteo, you harmed all who love them, who value them, And for those that died, everyone who misses them. <coughs> Mr. Ivanov, this is what you have done. Your actions are heinous. They are unpardonable. You deserve to be separated from society for the remainder of your life. And you shall. There is no just punishment other than to separate you from society for the remainder of your life, and that shall be the sentence of this court. It is the court's view that this is 
both just punishment and necessary to protect the community. And so, as to count one, for the aggravated first degree murder committed with domestic violence and a firearm enhancement, the court imposes life without parole, including a 60 month firearm enhancement. And as to count two, for the aggravated first degree murder with a firearm enhancement for the murder of Jordan Ebner, the court imposes life without parole and a 60 month firearm enhancement. And as to count three, for the aggravated first degree murder of Jacob Long, with a firearm enhancement, the court imposes life without parole with a 60 month firearm enhancement. And as to count four, for the attempted first degree murder of William Kramer, with a firearm enhancement, the court imposes 240 months in confinement with a 60 month firearm enhancement to be followed by 36 months of community custody on conditions that I, on conditions that I will address in a few minutes. And as to count five for attempted first degree murder of Tristan Bratfold and Alex Levine with a firearm enhancement the court imposes 200 with the 60 month firearm enhancement to be followed by 36 months of community custody on conditions that I will address in a few minutes. Each count will be served consecutively. Each count will be served beginning with the consecutive service of the 60 month sentences on each of the firearm enhancements. While it may be academic to describe or discuss the terms of community custody, it is necessary that I do so. You are to abide by the terms of community custody, including the payment of legal financial obligations that I will address in a few minutes. You are to undergo a mental health evaluation, follow all treatment recommendations, including the taking of any prescribed medications. In terms of legal financial obligations, Mr. Peel, do you wish to speak to those other than I think, what's been I think what's been represented to the court is a request for only the necessary legal financial obligations. Your Honor, the, uh, the court recognizes that at present the ability to pay any legal financial obligations, but we assume that that condition will continue. We would ask the court to waive any waivable uh, legal financial obligation and find that he is indigent and for that purpose uh, while the court may feel it does not have the authority we ask that all legal financial obligations be waived. Does the state wish to speak to this at all? Uh, we defer to the discretion. Uh, we defer to the discretion. You are 20 years old, Mr. Ivanov. You are going to be incarcerated for the remainder of your life. Satisfy legal financial obligations is necessarily limited. The court will impose the non waivable legal financial obligations a $500 victim penalty assessment, a $200 criminal filing fee, a $100 DNA fee. The court will reserve on the issue of restitution. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
and the court will enter an order uh, that directs that the legal financial obligations that have been imposed um, be satisfied within 10 years of today's date for the payment rate um, that Mr. Ivanov represents today he can afford. So, Mr. Peel? Well, Your Honor, as of today, Mr. Ivanov does not have the ability to make payment. There's $800 in legal financial obligations that are non waivable. Yes, I understand that. But the court was setting a, a condition based on present ability. I would ask the court to set a nominal uh, amount with the understanding that the Department of Corrections, I think, as a matter of routine, will address that with any uh, earnings, however minimal they might be, during the time of incarceration. Mr. Cornell? Um, Certainly, Mr. Ivanov is going to be required to work in prison, and certainly he will be paid some nominal amount of money. Um, should he live his natural life, um, he will have plenty of time and money to pay off his not only legal financial obligations, but the substantial restitution that the state will seek. So, uh, Mr. Ivanov will have a chance to make some money and, and pay back financially. Uh, what follows society. Based upon Mr. Ivanov's current ability to pay, the court will at this time set um, his payment rate at $15 a month. First payment to begin within 90 days of today's date. And as I indicated, all payments to be complete within 10 years. The issue of restitution would be reserved. Um, do, does either party wish to address um, the expectations for restitution or the need for restitution hearing at this time and whether or not Mr. Ivanov wishes to be present for any such hearing? Your Honor, the, uh, the defense has no objection to there being a delay in determining what the restitution is and pursuant to statute allow the state to make a determination and presentation the, uh, and schedule a hearing and if necessary one can be conducted. If that happens we would waive the presence of Mr. Ivanov understanding that by waiving he continues to receive notice of any hearing that will be scheduled and he can request to be present but he's not required to be present and there will be no automatic order of transport to a hearing. Uh, unless there's a separate request and the defense makes that happen. Uh, does that answer the court's question as regards to the defense? It does. Thank Mr. Cornell? And we understand we have an obligation in the hearing within 180 days and we certainly do so and notify the defense. Are there any other matters relevant to the term of incarceration? Um, or the legal financial obligations that the court should address at this time before I advise Mr. Ivanov of his loss of firearm rights and other rights. Your Honor, I didn't hear the court um, impose the domestic violence uh, assessment, which I think is also statutorily required. Um, and then also with regard to community custody and condition of sentence, it may it may seem academic, but if the court imposes as a condition of sentence that no contact with all the people who we will list in the appendix and we provided notice to the defense, um, the, court, the defendant could be found in contempt of court. It may seem academic, but it's important to the victims and to the family members of the deceased. So we would ask the court to impose as a condition of sentence no contact with the individuals, no contact with the individuals who will be listed in an appendix to the judgment of sentence. Um, uh, and we will provide uh, written anti-harassment orders for those people that we've notified the defense, and I believe the court intends to enter those orders. Your Honor, we have nothing after the request was made. We are on notice, and the names have been identified. Excuse me. The names have been identified, so it's possible to understand the scope and intent of the order. All right. Um, the court will um, impose the no contact provisions as part of the judgment and sentence 
the names of the individuals who are part of the no contact requests have been made known to the court and the court is known to the court and the court is aware that there will be separate anti harassment orders proposed as well and the court understands that the defense has received notice of that and has no objection. So the court will also make that today's orders. In terms of the domestic violence assessment, Mr. Peel, do you wish to speak to that? I think it falls within, the, excuse me, that I believe falls within the same discussion I had concerning other legal financial obligations. The statute requires it, but we ask the court to wait. Well, the court will add the $200 domestic violence assessment. Mr. Ivanov, legal financial obligations that are part of today's judgment and sentence will total, judgment and sentence will total $1,000. Now, in terms of your firearm rights, Mr. Ivanov, all individuals convicted of a felony offense in this possess firearms, and it's the court's duty to advise you that as a result of these convictions, you may not possess and under federal law possess any, under state law, you may not possess any firearms, and under federal law, you may not possess any firearms or ammunition until your right to do so is restored by a Washington State Superior Court and by a federal court if required. Do you understand? Yes. You also may not vote in any election until your right to vote is restored. If that right is restored, if that right is important to you, read the judgment and sentence to determine what steps you may take, if any, to reclaim that right. By virtue of the fact that you entered a plea of guilty to these charges, Mr. Ivanov, you do not have a right to appeal the judgment of the court because it is within the standard ranges prescribed by law. However, there may be limited appeal rights, including rights of collateral attack, which typically must be filed within a year of today's proceedings. Your counsel can provide advice as to those rights. And unless there is a request from either party at this time, that concludes the court's oral findings and decision. And I will ask all who are present to remain seated while Mr. Ivanov is escorted from the courtroom so that he may review the necessary paperwork with his attorneys. And I can return to the courtroom to sign the judgment and sentence once it has been reviewed by Mr. Ivanov, unless other plans are made. And will the defendant waive presence of presentation? Your Honor, the court has indicated that you will return for presentation of the judgment and sentence, so no waiver is required by the defendant, unless the counsel's intention is that we not bring Mr. Ivanov back, but the court addresses the judgment and sentence otherwise in open court. I'm not sure what the court's intention was. I was really looking for an expression from both parties as to what your preference is. If Mr. Ivanov waives his presence at signing, I will return to open court to sign the documents without his appearance. If he does not 